today it's my great pleasure to have a conversation with Dr. J. Bernard Matchen, who is no stranger to our school. Let me just give you a little bit of an introduction and then we'll jump right into our conversation. Dr. Matchen is originally from Mississippi and he went to Vanderbilt for his undergraduate degree. And growing up in St. Louis, he went back to St. Louis University for dental school. After dental school, he did a pediatric dentistry residency and a PhD in educational psychology at the University of Iowa. He's been a faculty member at many different schools, including the University of Maryland, George Washington University, the University of Iowa, and he's also served as a major in the US Army Corps. We had the good fortune at the University of Michigan to recruit him as our Dean, where he came from the University of North Carolina in 1989 and served as Dean until 1995. At that time, there was great need at the university level for his leadership as our university provost. And he served as our university provost for I believe two and a half or three years before then he was recruited to the University of Utah's president in 1997. And then in 2004, recruited to the University of Florida as the president of the University of Florida, which he served until the end of 2014. He is an incredible leader and he has been a great resource of advice to me in my Dean role, as well as throughout my career. Uh, Dr. Matchen was Dean when I was recruited to Michigan as an assistant professor, and I've always been impressed with his great leadership skills. So it's very appropriate for us to have a conversation with Dr. Matchen, and let's just start with a few questions. Welcome. Thanks, Can Lord. I can I call you Bernie or shall I? Can I, I... Call, you, can I call you Lori? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so first I'm curious, I mean, you know, it seemed like you were destined to be a university president from the time you were in high school, but you went to dental school. I'm curious why you went to dental school. And then, you know, as leading on from there, what your perspective has been about the dental profession relative to higher ed and uh, what higher ed looks at um, to the dental profession. Yeah, well, I, I grew up in St. Louis, as you said, and um, one of my mentors and role models was my uncle, who, is, who was an orthodontist. And uh, I worked in his uh, models lab, made retainers and study models for him when I was in high school. And he was lobbying me for dentistry from the time I was 15 or 16 years old. And, and frankly, I, I looked at dentistry and medicine side by side and I like dentistry better. I just look like a profession where you could make something good happen without having to sell your soul and you could still have a life. So I was tracked for dentistry, I would say from the time I was in high school, but I was tracked to be a practitioner. And in my mind, in those days, you could go to graduate school through an apprenticeship program. And the deal was I was going to go to dental school and then I was going to apprentice with my uncle and become an orthodontist. And then um, as it turned out, my uncle and I were good nephew uncle, but we decided we wouldn't be good employer <laughs> employees. And I kind of went my own way and I came under the tutelage of one of my professors at dental school, Dr. Herbert Butts, who went on to be uh, a dean at the dental school at Southern Illinois, but he went to South Carolina Dental School right after, before I graduated. And he wrote me a letter, said, Dear Almost Dr. Matchen, why don't you come to South Carolina and teach dentistry? And I had always kind of liked 
the academic side of dentistry. And I was a little un sure about the business side of dentistry, about having to open my own practice and hire people and run a business. So I figured, why not? The Vietnam War was another incident that kind of stimulated me to stay out of the army for a while. So we went to South Carolina, fell in love with teaching, went to night school there, got a master's degree in education. And then uh, the rest just took on after itself. The, Dentistry got one of those uh, federal training grants for teacher training that Iowa had. They hired me. I'd always wanted to be a pediatric den dentist. Pediatric dentistry looked to me to be the best part of dentistry. You're dealing with young patients. You're helping prevent problems instead of dealing with the failures of dentistry. So anyway, it all felt really good to me, but I can't say I tracked to be a, a professor from the very beginning. I really did kind of fell into it. But I, one of the things I've learned in my life is if it feels good and you like it, there must be something about it that makes you take a second look. So that's what happened. That's how I got to be a, a dental teacher. And uh, then I got sidetracked into administration. I never really was sure about administration, but in North Carolina, I got involved in curriculum building and academic development and stuff like that. Next thing you know, I'm an associate dean. Next thing you know, I'm at Michigan with, with Kotowitz and Duderstadt. And then I really went off the deep end and Duderstadt, I, I think he's still around Michigan, but he, he was is. quite a character in those days. And, um, uh, and he sort of took me under his wing and said, you're, you're gonna like this. And I said, Jim, I'll only do it as an interim thing because he, he had fired his provost and he needed an interim provost and every other Dean wanted to be the provost and I didn't. And so Jim said, you're the one I'm gonna take. So he took me over to the Fleming building. And as some things happened, I fell in love with what I was doing over there. And then um, the real, fun part of that was I got to take my best friend and mentor and make him the dean who should have been the dean anyway that would be Bill Kotowitz mm -hmm. and then I had no idea that university administration would open up to a dentist you know it's very there were maybe two dentists in the country who were university presidents but it turns out that being a provost at Michigan puts you in a pretty special place so that other universities look at you and then you know the rest is history I just went where I thought I could do some good and so far it's been a great ride so so being a president at two universities one with a dental school and one without I'm curious you know what the view is from that level of the dental profession you know, um, I, I think the end of the story is quite good. I think dentistry has become much more an accepted part of the academic community in the last 25 years, certainly at the places I've been, being Michigan, North Carolina, mm -hmm. Iowa, and Florida. These are institutions where dentistry is part of the academic setting. But at the time I got into administration, dentistry was sort of a marginal academic discipline. It was not perceived to be a core discipline. In fact, one of the reasons I was taken to be the Dean of Dentistry at Michigan was that Jim Duderstadt was unhappy that the dental school at Michigan had drifted outside the core of the academic enterprise at Michigan. And one of my challenges and really one of my opportunities at Michigan was to try to bring the dental school back up to the academic level. Of course we did, look at, look who we got as Dean now. We got a real <laughs> academic, you know? So um, I think over time, of course we have some for-profit dental schools now that I think have given up the pretense of being academic and they just sort of moved outside of, of and maybe that's okay. But I, I think um, dentistry can be as shown by Michigan, Florida, Iowa, um, 
and an academic discipline, and it's well respected. It has to do with what the people do on the campus where we're being evaluated. And that's why take having dentistry of Michigan right in the middle of the campus, being able to convert clinic space into research space and getting our faculty much more involved in the great mission of research at Michigan makes me say that I think we're well respected. And a lot of it has to do with the deans. The deans are a collegial group at institutions like this. And I think we were, we were accept, I was accepted into the, co the colleagues of deans at Michigan. The deans we have had here at Florida have all been very well respected. And I know for a fact that you fit in that mold as well, Laurie. Well, thank you. I think you're right in that it is the environment and the collegial nature of the other deans. I've been quite fortunate. Um, I'm going to share my screen again to prompt another photo. And this um, is a photo when you were dean here. And I believe if I remember correctly, it was a board of governors meeting where we have our uh, key alumni. I remember attending one of these meetings. I was invited as an assistant professor to share the work that I was doing. And I just remember being so impressed with how you led the conversation and, and how you worked the room, so to speak. I'm wondering if you would talk about just tips for individuals because um, actually one of the, the key purposes for this video is for a leadership elective for dental students. How, you know, what are your tips for communicating in meetings in small group settings? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, and it's something that I really feel strongly about one of the courses I took in high school, now think about that, that, that was <laughs> 60 years ago. And I still remember to this day, my teacher, Ms. Fredrickson, but it was a class in public speaking. And we did extemporaneous speeches, we did prepared speeches and all that. And it was a skill that I think everyone should have, but most people don't take the time to realize that it's not that easy to communicate with people. Furthermore, being a dentist, if you're gonna be successful interacting with patients, you better learn how to communicate. That means you need to listen to the patient, what's on their mind, what's bothering them so that you can solve their problem. So I think communication is a core value that has sort of permeated my life from the very beginning. I do think that certain people are drawn to certain positions. For example, in uh, high school, I was the commencement speaker at my high school. I was also the senior class vice president and the captain of the football team. So the, the idea of being in positions where you get to use your communication skills doesn't just happen. You, there are certain people that are drawn to that and certain people that aren't. But whether or not you're a public speaker before lots of people, the thing you're talking about is communicating with people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. That's a skill that a successful dentist must have, mm -hmm. or they're not gonna be successful in the clinical practice of dentistry. So, so I think it all fits together. Everyone thinks being a dentist and a university administrator is like, apples and you know oranges, but it's not really. I tell people I have the best magazine stands out in my <laughs> waiting room and they're always on time. And I always chin my appointments at the appropriate time to take the next appointment. Uh, that's sort of tongue in cheek, but the truth is that kind of interaction and communication is very necessary in dentistry. And it's really important in, in in other professions as well, but I don't think we get credit for being good at those kinds of things in dentistry. Yeah, it's interesting because I ran across a quote in one of the news articles. I think this was when you were going to Utah. It's talking about you. It says, a soft 
outspoken Southerner, he's at the same time gentle and disarmingly direct. <laughs> Which I think, you know, it, it is a wonderful combination, right? Well, I think that's my Midwestern roots. You know, you can relate to that, uh, that we, uh, we don't beat around the bush. It, it just it, life is not meant to be talked about in riddles. And I've always found the best way to deal with issues or people is straight on. And, mm -hmm. and most all the time, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it does work. Okay, you talked earlier about Bill Kodowitz. So this shows a photo of you and Bill. Again, I'm presuming from the early 90s. And it highlights, I mean, some people would say that Bill was your right hand man, so to speak. I'm just curious. I mean, the success that the two of you engendered here is you know, an incredible legacy and um, has set the school up for success for many, many decades after. I'm curious if you would talk about how you develop your leadership teams, because you've done that at multiple institutions. Right. I, you know, I actually, I, I hadn't thought about it for a long time, but people have commented in several different venues about the leadership team that I put together, both at Michigan, at Utah, and, and here at Florida. And, and I really do think that the key to one's success in administration is the people with whom you work. <clears throat> None of us is as good as all of us. I remember that from some platitude someone read to me, but it means you have to hire really good people. And Bill is a great example of that. He, would, he, was, he was very highly respected because of his distinguished career at Michigan. He had been the interim dean during the turmoil before I came. Some say I should have not kept him on, but he knew every rock that needed to be turned over. And he knew every single aspect of what we were trying to do, but it was easier really for someone to come in from the outside and to not have history. As long as I had the history from Bill, we were able to work together and get the things done that needed to, to get done. It goes beyond that. The other, we, we took a dental school that I think they had either 16 or 18 departments before I got there. A department was simply three faculty members and a letterhead. They didn't have any real reason to be a department. And Jim Duderstadt encouraged me to think about real academic departments. And so we went down to six and we hired all new department chairmen. And uh, the, the first one turned out to be th the real role model for the other chairs we were looking at. And that was Martha Summerman. And she came from Maryland, totally outside, uh, to a dental school that had a huge periodontics tradition and lots of controversy embedded in that tradition. And yet Martha, sterling academic that she is, was exactly the kind of person we needed to be an academic department chairman. She is academic by nature, and she was willing to do the job of I don't think she really liked it at first, but she knew that she could get done what she wanted by being the department chairman. So we very carefully picked the department chairman. I picked the people that worked with me as vice, you know, as, as deans and associate deans. Same thing happened when I went to Utah. I didn't know anybody at Utah. My wife and I went out there just because we fell in love with the West and the people of, of, uh, of Salt Lake City. So I had to hire a totally new administration out there. When I left after five years, almost all the people that were there stayed in that job. They put a new dean in place and the University of Utah just kept coming right along uh, with, with the team that we had put in place. Same thing happened here at Florida. They had had a period of unrest. I spent a lot of time working on who I was gonna hire. So really, 
a, a, a senior administrator, the bigger the job, the more you do this, is a, is a talent scout. You have to find good people and then you have to empower them to do their jobs. And if that happens, you're gonna be a success and you don't deserve the credit. It's the people that you have around you that really do all the good. And look how deep we came at, at, at Michigan. First Bill, then Peter Polverini, who we had hired. And then along came this little assistant professor that came mm -hmm. from, from pathology at Ohio State. And there she is, right? Well, you know, Martha, at least four faculty that she recruited went on to become deans of dental schools. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she she was a great, she always told me she didn't like administration, but she was <laughs> she was a good enough administrator to know what she had to get done, but she didn't let it control her life. I think that's the way to think yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. She was very good. Okay, let me go back. So this is actually a photo. I can see it over your shoulder in, in the image. And um, I would love for you to share the story behind this photo. One of my uh, vice presidents here, um, I'm not going to identify which one it was, but he had, in, he had as his responsibility a very high profile area of the university, very controversial, and he had to make lots of decisions that were tested in the court of public opinion. And I didn't know him before I came and, and I had considered not keeping him on, but I did. And it turned out to be a great match in the sense that I developed a deep respect for him and he appreciated the support that I was able to give him. And basically what I did was, is I was able to support and endorse and affirm the decisions that he made while he was running his operation. When I retired, we had a little dinner for some of us. And he presented me this Mangelson picture, which is my favorite picture of all. I love Mangelson, the photographer who has all these great natural pictures, but this one is especially poignant to me. And as you say, I have it in my office here and it'll be with me as, as always. And it had a plaque that goes with it. And I'll read you just little pieces of that. You know, um, in the end, leaders are much like eagles. They don't flock. You find them one at a time. And I, I think that he respected my leadership in the sense that I supported him, empowered him, and uh, enabled him to become one of the best at what he did in the, uh, in the entire country. And it was, it was not an easy call because there were people who wanted him to be removed when I came, but I'm just like a lone eagle. I do what I think is right. And, and that's the way you have to do it. It's kind of like, you know, a dean who writes a letter with us, several other deans that <laughs> criticizes a member of the uh, board of trustees. You know, what? you ever know anybody where that happens? You're up on the latest news, aren't you? <laughs> yes, you bet I am. Yeah, well, that's leadership. And it, I mean, that's not going to other than the fact that that's the right thing to do and that you, you cohort of deans are the right ones to do it, there's no payoff for you in that. And I think um, leaders just sort of know when they have to stand up. One of my favorite examples at Michigan was, now remember around the, around the late 90s, most universities in the public arena did not have benefits for the same-sex partners of couples at the university. Michigan wanted to do it. And Jim Duderstad had to form a task force to uh, vet the issue in the greater university community. And I kind of said, oh, Jim, why don't, why don't you let somebody else do that? And he had me picked out from the get-go. So I co-chaired with a gay 
associate dean of the medical school, female. We were the co-chairs of this committee and we had public hearings. I was even on that 50,000 watt radio station down in Detroit, whatever it's called. And frankly, we had a number of dental school alumni resign because I chaired that committee. So it was not, it was not an easy read and it was somewhat, contra this was now late nineties. It was still a somewhat controversial activity. But when you got in there and you saw what was happening and you saw what needed to happen, it was easy. You just, you just did the right thing. And it helped to have a president like Jim Dudestad behind me. But we had to go to the board of trustees. We had to have an open vote. I got criticized openly in the meeting by one of the trustees, but um, all in all, it worked out very well. Yeah, I remember that. I, you know, that was pretty uh, much a standout on our campus. And in fact, I mean, it it wasn't just gay rights. You, I think, were ahead of your time in supporting diversity on our campus. And I think you went on to do that at Utah and Florida as well. Any, it's kind, of a, it's yeah. kind of a funny story. The gay community at Utah knew before I came that I had done that at Michigan. They asked for a meeting with me. Remember, this is conservative Utah. Yeah. And they said, Bernie, we've been trying for 10 years to get this done. Would you do it for us? Well, I said, okay, I don't know if I can do it, but we got it done in Utah. Then I came to Florida. The gay community there knew I had done it in Michigan and Utah, and it had never been done in the South. So we did it again. So I, I did it three times. So what's the secret? The secret is to not give in to the innuendos and the half-truths and the stuff that that circulates around controversial issues and just treat things that are important, like the issue you're addressing today in your, in your uh, newspapers. Treat them with respect, but don't be afraid to speak out. And in the end, you have to have confidence that the right thing's gonna happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that work. I mean, that work that you set the stage for is continuing and uh, what you did was really important. Thank you. Okay, let's move to another photo. So this is a family photo from about 1990. And students often ask me about work-life balance. And so I'm Wondering if you would comment on work-life balance and how you've managed that through your professional career. It's probably the most important question that should be looked at by any professional. They're, because the professions are by their nature all consuming. You could spend 100% of your time, I don't care if you're a lawyer, or you're a veterinarian, or you're a, a dentist, um, your profession can consume you. But if you do that, I don't think you'll be the whole person that you really want to be. And it will make you less of a professional in my opinion, but it's a tension that will always be there and you're just gonna have to fight it. If you're lucky enough to have a partner and you respect them, and want to make a place for them in your life, then they have to have a place in your life. And you have to constantly keep reminding yourself about that. This picture was actually taken in Gothenburg, Sweden, when my family and I took a three month sabbatical, a mini sabbatical, which was not that common in, in those days. And it was the first time my family and I had gone away out of the country on an extended uh, time off. They proved to be a real um, game changer for me. I actually was recruited to Michigan while I was in Sweden. And um, my kids, the, the one on the right, the bigger one, became a Michigan engineer. The one in the middle 
graduated from liberal arts and sciences at Michigan. And then the little girl in the front row went with me to Utah and she graduated from, from Utah. I bet they have fond memories of that time in Sweden. Oh, I mean, we went in the summer now, mid Sweden. I've been to Sweden in the summer and in the winter. And believe me, you don't wanna go in the winter time. <laughs> But the summers in Sweden are just wonderful. And we were there over midsummer, June, July, and part of August. And the, number one, the people have been cloistered in their houses all winter. So they're outdoors all the time. So there's it's almost a constant party in the summertime in Sweden. And the weather is just, and you have, and the, because of where you are uh, in the longitude, latitudinal thing, the days are real long. You have lots of sunlight in the summertime. So it's a great it's a great thing to do. I recommend it. I, I suppose that was your only sabbatical. It was. Okay. It was. Just an incredibly busy career. Okay. I have one more photo. So this is, I believe, in the Dean's office here in the School of Dentistry. And the photo behind you is a uh, painting of the dental school, which still is in uh, my office. You may be aware that we're currently undergoing a major renovation of the school. We're a little bit past halfway. I'm curious if you would comment, I mean, as a university president, facilities come of importance again and again. I'm curious if you would just talk about the role of facilities in an academic setting in a university. Well, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? You know, on, on the one hand, this new building you're putting together at at Michigan, it's going to enable you to do things you couldn't otherwise do. It's a fabulous opportunity for you. On the other hand, it's probably consuming a lot of your time and making and raising money is something that all deans and university administrators have to do for good causes, fine, but it, it, it just sometimes the academic part of your mission kind of gets put aside while you're raising money for these facilities. So. They're great to have. They do advance the cause of the institution. There was a Harvard president, I forgot his name now. This is back in the 80s. He said that it's a curious fact that every 10 years, the amount of square footage on the campus doubles, even though the class size stays the same <laughs> and, the, and the faculty size stays essentially the same. So building buildings is one of the things the universities do. And uh, it continues to this day at Michigan, I know, it does, is doing it here at Florida. The thing you gotta be careful about is you don't let it consume you and take you away from your primary mm -hmm. mission, which is education and research. Uh, but if done right, it can advance both of those causes. If done wrong, it can kind of get in a get in the way of the real mission of the institution. So I applaud what you do. Bill Kotowitz and I are absolutely in awe of your ability to pull that renovation off. Yeah. We we couldn't even conceive of it in our in our time. I you may remember that I took one of the clinics and turned them into uh, or two of the clinics yeah. turned them into research labs, but that was nothing like what you've done. Well, we're not done yet. <laughs> but um, I think we, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm curious because um, I know there will be dental students that will be watching this. If you would like to give any advice to dental students who are aspiring to be leaders, whether it be in their communities and their professional associations or in academia, yeah, I'd like to speak to that for a minute. First of all, I think that dental professionals have a responsibility of leadership. And that could be at the 
home level, it could be at the local community level, it could be at the state or national level, but by virtue of your educational status, by virtue of your position in the community, you are a leader. Now you can accept that mantle or you can reject it, but you have a, I think a responsibility to help do the things that need to be done in your community or even in your profession. You know, the dental profession has had some wonderful leaders to move it forward and it's had some big problems that have, have not been taken care of as they should for lack of leadership. So this requirement exists whether you're at a university level, a dental school level, a private practice level, or just a head of a household level. The responsibility to be a leader is there. And I think that uh, dental practitioners have to think hard about how to spend their time because as you will soon find if you're a dental student, you're not going to be successful unless you put yourself directly into your practice and make it happen. But all the time you put into your practice takes you away from your family, takes you away from your community, takes you away from all the things that you'd like to be involved in. So you have to, you have to be a careful uh, allocator of time or you're not going to get anything done. But I think you need to think about what can I do to make my community a better place? And whether it's helping with the public schools, with what's going right on right now with the pandemic, I think dental professionals can be real leaders in helping us get through this pandemic. And I think the public respects your opinion. So you should speak up and help get this vaccination accomplished or whatever the case will be going forward. I think you have both an obligation and a real opportunity to make a difference as a leader. Mm -hmm. It's both a privilege and a responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's been so nice talking with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the greater community? Oh, it's been wonderful thinking about the things that happened in Michigan. It was a wonderful place, still a wonderful place. And uh, it's really the sort of the birthplace of all of my big happenings in my life. So uh, I feel very good about it. And I really hope those of you who are lucky enough to be there enjoy the, are enjoying the time there. You know, I, I fondly remember many years ago having a conversation with Martha Summerman and talking about you and your leadership. And I remember saying, what a strong presence you have, you know, physically, but also academically, philosophically. And I, I just thank you for that. I thank you for your presence here many years ago. The fact that your presence set the stage for our continued success to me is undoubtable. So thank you so much, Bernie. I really, I, I've always enjoyed touching base with you over the years and I feel really fortunate that um, I was here at the right time in the right place under your leadership. Well, I had to go all the way to Mexico to get you, for goodness <laughs> sakes. So um, it was a trip well worth it. I can say that. Well, they, what you're referring to is having breakfast at an IEDR meeting in Acapulco because uh, Martha was not there, I think. She encouraged you to have breakfast with me and recruit me. Little did you both know that I had already decided that this was gonna be a good place for me, but. Yeah, well, it was a great, it was a great match for us too, actually. So thanks for thinking of me. It's always fun to talk about Michigan, especially after they won the basketball game last night. It's really a, it's a fun time for the University of Michigan. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed for UCLA tomorrow. Right. Good luck. Thank you, Bernie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.